Hello, my loves. Well, this is Remed 3, week 3, and we're going to be studying the nervous system, all right? There's no diagram on this test. This diagram is just to be able to help you with the terms and understand your nervous system. Nerves. I'm not talking about this kind. Oh, my nerves are bad. No, 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 no. These are the nerves that allow you to move. Allow you, if you get goosebumps, if because of nerves, the nerves sense the cold and it squeezes on the hair to keep the heat in and that's what makes you get goosebumps and your hair stand up. Nerves, there's two different types. I want you to understand. There's mo uh, sensory nerves. They sense things. Uh, you ever had a hot pot on the stove and you accidentally touch it and you go, ow! That took all of a nanosecond. The sensory nerve that you're touching the pot felt it and it's like, ah, oh, this is hot. Sensory. It went up to your brain, told your brain, stupid, that's hot. And then it sent the motor nerve back down for you to move your hand. So we have two types of nerves. You have sensory and you have motor nerves. Sensory feels things. Motor nerves allow us to move, all right? So I just want to go over this with you real quickly, all right? This is actually two nerves. This is a nerve right here, and this is another nerve right here. What we have right here, these little finger-like projections are called dendrites. That's what receives the stimulus, all right? You got to have stimulus. What we have here is the cell body. That contains the nucleus. The nucleus, as we know of anything, is the brain of everything. The axon is this long, dark line going down. That is the longest route the stimuli has to travel. I'm not doing too bad for reading backwards, huh? Now, this line around that black line is called the myelin sheath, all right? And uh, that is fatty tissue that covers the axon. Now remember, back, go back a minute, I forgot to tell you something. The axon uh, carries the impulse away from the nerve cell. So the axon's gonna carry it this way, away from, always. Sorry, back to the myelin sheath. That's fatty tissue that covers the axon. And I'm gonna tell you something, my husband has multiple sclerosis and it's because that myelin sheath has worn away and every once in a while, two nerves will actually touch each other, axons. And oh my God, it's like paralysis always. Okay, what we have here is the neurolemma. The neurolemma is, I can't read that one, is a membranous sheath that covers the axon. So we had fatty, now we have membrane. Then we have down here, terminal end fibers. They look a little bit like dendrites, but they're much thinner. Terminal end fibers. This is where the impulse leaves the cell, okay? The impulse has traveled along this cell. Finally, we have this space here. I don't know if you can see the space between these little terminal end fibers and the next dendrites. All of that yellow stuff is space, all right? An area between it. The space is called the synapse. The synapse is where the impulse travels or jumps from one uh, neuron to the next. I'm saying neuron because that's the technical term for a nerve cell, neuron. So this is what we have. Now, at the bottom I wrote, afferent carries the impulse toward the cell body. Afferent is gonna carry it toward the cell body. Efferent nerves carry impulse away from the cell body, all right? Okay, this a lot of this we're gonna cover on the notes. I just wanted you to see nerves. Okay, and like I said, you have sensory nerves which allow you to feel, and then we have motor nerves. If I wanted to lift my hand off the other hand, I would have to send an impulse to my brain saying, I want to lift that hand. And the motor nerves would come down from my brain to my hand and let me do it. All right, now, I have this for you too. I know it looks a little confusing, but stick with me. This is the nervous system in a nutshell, okay? The nervous system is composed of the central nervous system. That's what CNS is. Don't write it down, it's in the notes. Central nervous system, think of central, straight up and down. And that's gonna include your brain and spinal cord, all right? Brain and spinal cord. The other part of the nervous system 
is the peripheral nervous system. What that is, is everything that comes off of the central. So this is the central. And if I had little fibers coming off the central, that would be the peripheral, all right? Now, the per peripheral also contains what's called autonomic. It looks like the word automatic, and it, guess what? It actually acts like that, all right? It controls involuntary activity of the internal organs. Let me ask you something. After you chew something, do you have to say, wait, mm, I can't talk. I have to manage my esophagus. Wait, I have to manage my stomach while it's, the nerves are making my stomach turn to food. No, it's internal. It's automatic, autonomic. Get it? Okay, what autonomic also regulates is breathing, heart rate, body temperature, pupil size, okay? Uh, blood pressure and your internal organs. Now, let's get back to the nerve. Okay, let me show you something here. All right, this right here, cranial nerves. Remember, they have brain and spinal cord. The brain has cranial nerves, and you can look in your book, on, I think it's page 353, around that area, and you can see where the brain and spinal cord, the brain has its own nerves coming off. The spinal cord has its nerves. All right, here we go. Cranial nerves, all right? You have 12 pair, and they control the face. You're going to have to be very aware of some of these nerves as a dental assistant, okay? Because if you do something too, too wrong, you could affect the nerve. And if you damage a nerve, it can cause paralysis, all right? You want to be real careful. So those are the cranial nerves, all right? You have 12 pairs, six on each side. Then we have the spinal nerves. This is all coming down from the peripheral. Remember, central is just brain and spinal cord. Spinal nerves, you have 31 pair. I'm holding this sideways, sorry. 31 pair. If you've ever seen the skeleton in the classroom, you'll notice in the back where the, the, the spine is, the, the bones, okay? Well, you have 31 pairs of nerves that come out from the spinal cord, all right? We have eight cervical nerves, eight, right up in here. And they're located and they're called C1 through C8 for simplicity reason. We have 12 pair of thoracic nerves. Thoracic, thoraco means chest, ic means pertaining to. You have thir uh, 12 pair there. We have five pair of lumbar nerves. Ladies, this can be the most injured part of your spinal cord, all right? If, if you're working, because if you have to move a patient and you don't do it with good body mechanics, you're looking for an injury to yourself. And you're going, I'm a dental assistant. I'm not a medical assistant moving patients. Oh, but what if a patient comes in in a wheelchair and you have to transport them from the wheelchair to the dental chair? Let me tell you how to do it because I can't show you. Bend your knees. I'm gonna say it over here. Bend your knees. When you pick anything up, don't just bend straight over because I promise you, I have had seven back surgeries on the lumbar area. It is no fun, believe me. And once they do operate on your back, it, your back is never the same, the nerves are never the same, and you are never the same. Pain kind of goes with that territory. Coming on down, we have five sacral nerves, and they're uh, called, located, I mean, they're known as S1 through S5. Now, this is actually five bones that fused together, all right, to form one bone, but it actually was five bones. And finally, we have that one coccygeal. That is a piece at the end of your spine, the end of the bones. Now, I'm not talking about spinal cord, I'm talking about that's not even that big, not even that big. You get it? It's way underneath. It's the tailbone. But if you fall and you land flat on your butt and you compress that coccygeal, there's nothing they can do for it. There's no surgery, nothing they can do to help it other than tell you sit on several pillows for several months. Now remember, bones regrow. Blood is made in our bones. Blood and bones work together. So the bone will grow back, but you know yourself, anytime you have to repair something, it's never as good as it was originally. 
So be careful, all right? Please be careful. Now, I know you all must have gone cuckoo when I sent you these two pages by email of vocabulary terms. I'm gonna go over these with you right now before we do the notes. I mean, I didn't get to the notes till tomorrow, but every one of these terms is in the notes, but I wanted to make sure that you got these terms and you study these two pages of terms. In fact, I have to add one on for you. If you get a pencil or a pen and get the second page, I'll tell you what I have to add, all right? So, pause the video, go get your pen, pencil, paper, whatever you need. We're gonna add number 33 to our vocabulary terms, all right? And number 33 is cerebrum, C-E-R-E-B-R-U-M. Cerebrum, we're talking about the brain now, the actual brain. The cerebrum, you need to know, is the largest part of the brain. That's what you need to write down. It is the largest part of the brain. I wish my husband would come in here. I'd take his skull off and show you what a brain. No, I couldn't do that. I mean, you know, I could, but I guess I wouldn't. All right, let's go over these vocabulary terms, all right? All right, number one, we just did that when we looked at the diagram. Synapse, the space between nerve cells. Now, let me tell you something. How do nerve cells know to jump one to the next, to the next, to the next? How come when they're jumping, they don't go crazy? Because in that synapse, in that space, there's chemicals that keep the impulse straight. Otherwise, it would get to the very end of the first nerve cell and neuron and go crazy, all right? Imagine somebody that's paralyzed. For your whole life, you've been able to move your arm, when you, your hand, when you want to and you were in some type of incident or accident, trauma, and you damage the nerves coming from the spine that go to the arm, all right, and the hand. Now you can't move it at all. However old you are when this happened, and God forbid it should happen, you've been able to move your fingers and your arms whenever you want to. But imagine now, all of a sudden, you can't move it. And your brain is still telling your hand, move but it won't move. Now you still have sensory nerves. You can still feel, but you just can't move it. That would drive me crazier than I already am, all right? My mother had strokes and she had embolisms in the brain which ruptured and she was paralyzed on the right side. And at first, it, she, you know, she would try to move it because it, for 45 years, that's what she was able to do. And then all of a sudden, couldn't do it, all right? Okay, back to the terms. Synapse, space between the nerves. Gait, and I, I spelled it correctly. That's a manner of walking. What is your gait? Do you swing your butt? Do you swing your arms? Do you just kind of do it like that? You know what I'm talking about. Cerebellum. Now, this is another part of the brain that is responsible for coordinating our muscle movement and maintaining our balance. All right? Cerebellum. Afferent nerves, I just showed you that a little bit on that di the bottom of that diagram. These are nerves that carry impulses toward your brain and spinal cord from the stimulus, all right? Somebody smacks you. The afferent nerve had to carry that impulse to your brain to say, hey, that hurt. That's how you knew it, all right? Dementia, it's me, but not quite that bad yet. Dementia is a mental decline and deterioration. And unfortunately, there's a lot of senior citizens that suffer from dementia. And it is a terrible disease because you watch the person that you knew, you grew up with. They raised you. They, they nurtured you. And sometimes they don't even remember your name. All right? So that's dementia, a mental decline. Syncope. That is fainting. Just pass out. Boom. That's it. Medulla is the organ. Now, this is different. It's the organ that connects the brain and the spinal cord, all right? It's known as the medulla. And we're going to get to another part, just to get down a little bit further. For Raymond Magnum. Now, I want you to remember, listen to this. Here's your skull. Now, you got to get, the spinal cord has to come from your brain and go down. Well, if you got bone here, how's the spinal cord going to get into your brain? There is a hole at the base of your skull, an opening, 
And that's what it's called, the foramen magnum. And that is the opening where the spinal cord joins the brain. Let's see what I put. Look at that. I was pretty close. It's where they meet. So it's an opening at the end of your skull, the end of the bone, at the base of your brain. All right, TIA. It's an abbreviation. It stands for transient, which means not permanent. Ischemic means something's wrong with the blood vessels. Attack. And what it is, you may have heard somebody say they had a mini stroke. Well, these are the little capillaries in the brain that break off. And usually there's no permanent damage left from it, depending on how consumed it was, all right? But that is what it's called, a TIA, a transient ischemic attack. The next term is parathesis. And that is an abnormal sensation of tickling or pricking, all right? And my husband suffers from neuropathy, which this is part of because of being a diabetic. Diabetics have a lot of issues with their feet, and he feels like he's always being, his feet are very, very sensitive, and it feels like it's always being stuck. You know, can you imagine? Oh, no. Maybe that's why he's like he is. I don't know. Anyway, embolism. This is what my mother had. It's an obstruction of blood vessels by a clot. Now, it doesn't have to always be a blood clot, but 99% of the time it is. And embolism you have an thrombosis. Embolism is a traveling clot. It moves through the vessels. Thrombosis is a clot that's stationary. It stays where it is. You don't want it, but it stays there. You can get rid of it. Doctors can. But the embolism can travel. We had an instructor at the school. She was, came to work that morning and she didn't realize it. It was in her leg and her leg was hurting. By lunchtime, it was up into her chest. She made it to the emergency room one time, thank you. But an embolism is an obstruction. It, it blocks the blood vessel. No more blood can get through. So you can imagine the hemorrhage that goes on. Cerebral cortex. Whenever you hear the word cortex, think outer. Cortex has an O, outer has an O. This is the outer nervous tissue of your cerebrum, which is the largest part of the brain. It's tissue that covers your cerebrum, all right? <coughs> Excuse me. Aphasia. This is the inability to speak. Now, this usually occurs after a stroke, and it can not just be the inability to speak, but it's non-coherent speech. Look, I know I'm doomed eventually. What is going to happen? My grandmother had this. She had a stroke, and she had aphasia. And the poor thing, she knew what she wanted to say, but it came out, not in gibberish, but just words that didn't even go together. And it, she would get so frustrated, and I can understand why, because she knew what she was saying. So I tried really, really hard to understand what she meant. Uh, you know, it, it's frustrating for a person, but that is aphasia. Efferent. Well, remember, up in number four, we had afferent. Well, these efferent nerves are motor nerves. This provides movement, and it carries messages away from your brain and bra strap, brain and spinal cord, okay? Nerve uh, aff afferent are going to tra travel up to. That's the, the sensory. Aff efferent or motor, they're going to allow you to move. All right, receptors. Well, if you're sending out all these impulses with the neurons or nerves, you better have some place for them to go. And receptors are the organs that receive the nervous stimulation and passes it on to uh, afferent nerves. They're organs. I mean, like your esophagus feels it, and it travels. Look at that Ooh, saggy neck. It travels. Uh, the impulse travels all the way down your esophagus while you are swallowing. So your esophagus, like a snake that's eating a whole mouse, which is disgusting. But your esophagus works by squeezing the food through. All right. And if your nerves didn't work, the, the food would stop here because the impulse wouldn't go to the next nerve saying, uh, let's send it on down. That's what I'm talking about, all right? Okay, now, remember back up on number seven, we had medulla. Well, this is the medulla oblongata. And I got to tell you this, when I was in college, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, we had a nursing student that was pregnant. And 
and she gave birth to a little girl in my hand of God. She named that little girl Madula Oblongata. I don't remember her last name, but up in Monroe or West Monroe, there's a, about a 40 something year old woman walking around named Madula Oblongata. You can Google that and look it up. Anyway, that is the part of the brain that controls breathing, your blood vessels, and I said breathing twice. How you like that? It must be important. Your blood vessels. Wait a minute. My blood vessels are just like open. No, no, no. Your arteries have to move. You know your arteries receive blood at 40 miles an hour from your heart. So if your heart was going through a school zone, it'd get a ticket. But it travels like, and your arteries are like rubber bands. Well, then they have to have nerves so they can have the ability to move and open up. All right, when the blood's passing through. Hypothalamus. Now, if you've ever seen the movie Osmosis Jones, I recommend that you do. It's a cartoon, but it's really, 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 really good, and you can learn a lot. Hypothalamus is the part of the brain that controls the pituitary gland, which controls water balance, but more importantly, your body temperature. And in Osmosis Jones, the bad guy was after everybody's hypothalamus, so he could control everything. <laughs> Sensory nerves. These nerves are going to carry the impulse toward the brain and spinal cord. You sense it. You touched it. You felt it. All right? It's going to carry the nerve or the impulse up your arm. or up, Let's say you stepped on a rock. Oh, and you're barefoot. Oh, that hurts. You jump. It took a gazillionth of a nanosecond for your nervous system, your sensory nerves to send the nerve impulse all the way up from your foot to your brain for your brain to say, that hurts, move your foot. And for your motor nerves to make your foot jump off the rock when you stepped on it, all right? Okay, <laughs> we're moving on. Motor nerves are responsible for movement, motor movement. Paralegia, paraplegia, I'm sorry, paraplegia is a paralysis of the lower part of the body, usually the legs, all right? Parkinson's disease is a disease of the nervous system with a shuffling gait. The person, Michael uh, J. Fox has this. He was an actor. I don't know if you ever know, heard of him. But you, you kind of just, you don't pick your feet up. You kind of just shuffle along, all right? And you sometimes lose, you may look like you're having spasms, but nothing's wrong up here. I mean, you are totally and completely, you got it in the head, all right? <laughs> Meningitis, this can be bad meningitis now you first of all you have three layers covering the spine spinal cord it's protecting it and it's called meninges we're going to get to that three layers that have to protect the spinal cord well if you have meningitis guess what that is that is an infection of the meninges which are the three layers covering of the brain and spinal cord now meningitis can be viral or bacterial a friend of mine had a little boy, six years old. He was in kindergarten. And they went to school, but they were off for Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras break. We all went to the parades together. I mean, the night parades. We were out every night with the kids. They were young. And the day they were supposed to go back to school, that night, James, the little boy's name, woke up and told his mom he didn't feel good and he was throwing up several times. She thought it might be just excitement or you know he ate too much Mardi Gras day or whatever. And they went back to bed. And when she got up at six o'clock to wake the child up, he was dead. Blood vessels in his body had burst. He had meningitis, the viral type. And he picked it up from school. And what made me so angry was the school knew they had a child with meningitis there before the Mardi Gras break but they didn't notify the parents of any other kids because they didn't want to alarm them. Alarm them? I'll show you alarm. But this viral, is then they have to do a spinal tap. They have to withdraw some of the fluid in your spine to do the test for it. Now, um, viral, really gotta be, if it's treated, if you're lucky. Bacterial can be treated with antibiotics in a hospital. All right, spinal nerves. Like I told you in the beginning, we got 31 pairs of nerves from the spinal cord that goes down to the body. I'm watching this little red dot blink. I may get cut off. Uh, cranial nerves, we have 12 pairs of those. And these carry messages to and from the brain. 
sciatic nerve. I can tell you all about it and where it is. And I put, ouch. This is a nerve extending down from the base of your spine. So, I don't have a skeleton. Oh, on it. Oh, here we do. Look, watch this. Okay. See this? You have the, the cervical. You have the thoracic nerves. You have the lumbar. And off of that comes the sciatic nerve. It is the main nerve that goes from the spine down the thigh, outside of your thigh and down your leg, all right? The sciatic nerve is a nerve extending down from the base of the spine to the thigh and into the calf. If it is injured, it is extremely painful. You can't cough or take a deep breath, and God forbid you should sneeze if you have sciatic pain. You can't move. That's all I'm going to tell you. And you may hear sometimes elderly people say, oh, I have sciatica. Well, if they have that, it's, it's trust me, they're in pain. All right, multiple sclerosis. Well, here we go. That's my husband. I can show you him in a second. Which includes paresthesia. He's, he's blessed. He has the reoccurring type. To look at him, you think he's healthy as a horse. But he has the type that comes and goes. And there's no paralysis, thank God. But with most of multiple sclerosis, there's paresthesia, which is paralysis, muscle weakness, an unstable gait, very unstable walking, and possibly, again, the paralysis, all right? And they feel that prickling and tingling feeling a lot. All right, Pia Mater. Remember I told you there's three coverings around the brain and spinal cord? This is the first one. The innermost covering of the brain. It's part of the meninges. Arachnoid, next page. It's one of the layers, the second layer. It's the middle layer covering the brain and spinal cord. It got its name because it resembles a spider, like kind of going out. Um, it's also part of the meninges. And then we have the dura mater. So we have pia mater, arachnoid, and dura mater. And this is the outermost covering of the meninges and brain and spinal cord. This is what becomes infected in meningitis, all right? Okay, quadriplegia, we had paraplegia, that's two. Quad, four. Quadriplegia is paralysis of four extremities, both arms and both legs. And the spinal cord has to be injured in order for that to happen. People diving in shallow water, trauma vehicle accidents, motorcycle accidents. <laughs> Bell's palsy, this is a very painful, unilateral, meaning one side, okay, of facial paralysis. The cranial nerves are involved, and you they may look like the mouth droops and the eye may droop permanently, all right? And they don't appear to be the same as everybody else because of this, this paralysis. They can't feel on this side of the face. That's Bell's palsy. Now, sometimes it will be intermittent. It can come and go. And when it comes, it is painful. Imagine, okay, you ever hit your funny bone on your elbow? You hit the ulnar nerve. Hey, ain't a darn thing funny about that. Well, imagine living like that on the side of your face, okay? Occlusion, that is a blockage. This can be caused by a blood clot, maybe a piece of plaque that breaks off away from part of your blood vessel, or it can even be air. Now, it would have to be a lot of air, but you know, it can be air. And finally, number 33 is the cerebrum, the largest part of the brain. All right, I don't want to push my luck because I'm seeing this little red light keep blinking. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Tomorrow, we're going to really go over the, the notes really well. But what we did today was excellent. Excellent. You get me? Excellent. Okay? All right, I'm going to try and get this uploaded, downloaded, whatever, and work on intro and get that one out to you. All right, see you all in a little bit.